Welcome to Thoughts Matter. Joining me today is John Bachtel, who is the uh, the national chairman of the Communist uh, Party in the USA. So I met John at a uh, at a coffee shop about two weeks ago, and uh, it was just kind of a freak accident. But I happened to be reading the Communist Manifesto, and uh, so we were introduced. And uh, John was kind enough to offer to come on the show and discuss communism. So John, thank you so much for coming on. That was a pleasure pleasure to meet you, and I'm glad we're having this chance to you know talk about uh, all these interesting questions. Yeah, it's 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 really uh, should be a good conversation. It's something that I think is timely, you know, with the election coming up. These are issues that I'm sure are are relevant. Um, you mentioned that you were out canvassing earlier today, so obviously I think that's on your mind as well. Um, so let's just start out, if you don't mind, by defining what capitalism, or I'm sorry, what communism uh, means to you. I, I've seen a few different definitions, but uh, if you can start with defining communism, and then we'll start to kind of dig deeper. Yeah. Well, communism is basically, in some respects, it's a futuristic society, a classless society, a society that is, uh, you know, free from exploitation uh, and inequality, um, where people actually self-govern. And so in that sense, uh, you know, it's uh, de very democratic and actually people are fully free, you know, at that point. But you kind of have to uh, compare it also to capitalism. You know, capitalism is a society in which the, there's a very well, there's a ruling class, a capitalist ruling class uh, that exploits a very big uh, working class, which is a, you know, the mass majority of the uh, population. And they do it to gain, you know, uh, accumulate wealth. And uh, that's the sole purpose of, of the capitalist society is for the capitalist corporations and and capitalist ruling class to accumulate wealth, whereas a, a communist society, its purpose is to is to make life better for everybody, and and the people actually do the governing and uh, are in charge of everything. Okay. And by the way, there are there are as I I think I might have mentioned there are no classes. It's a classless society. So the corporate ruling class and very wealthy end up kind of disappearing as society progresses. All right. Um, so I, I caught a few different things there. I'm just trying to get a kind of a simplified definition. It's interesting to the classics. I hadn't actually heard that. Um, even reading the Communist Manifesto, I guess I didn't pick up on that if, if that was one of Marx Engels' ideas. Um, but certainly the idea of the people, kind of the working class, taking control of uh, political power and, and the means of production and then uh, you said making life better for everyone. Uh, any other key points that we should put down? Well, I think it's a it's a it's a type of society that's a, a you know a, a solidarity society. In other words, um, you know that uh, the benefit for each person depends on the benefit of everybody, and um, you know that's why uh, you know this. In, this idea of uh, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs, that um, everybody contributes what they can to society um, through their work and you know the different talents they they have, uh, and then people in return take what they they need. Everybody has different needs, and so it's important for society to to respond to that and and people. Uh, have a certain sense of solidarity, you know, looking out for each other, um, making sure that all of us benefit, and everybody raises up together. Okay, all right. I think we've got enough to work with there. Um, perfect, okay. So what I've got is, yeah, classes, make life better for everyone. The people are in control, or the working class. Um, the idea about solidarity that you mentioned, uh, and kind of summarizing that, and from each according to his ability, and uh, I'm sorry, to, yeah, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Um, who said that, by the way? Is that? 
I've uh, heard that before. Smart, but I think he might have gotten that from somebody else even okay. further back yeah. in history. I couldn't tell you who. One of those ancient phrases. Okay. Perfect. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to follow the postulate challenge format um, that I've, I've ex uh, expanded on in uh, previous videos. I even had an example with uh, Angeline Simonovich, which you may have seen before. And uh, so the, the concept is we're going to start with a conclusion, and then I'm going to ask why in a few different ways, and I'll try to avoid any leading questions. So call me out if I do start asking questions that are, that are too leading. But basically, I'm going to ask why, and we're going to try to work back to get to your core beliefs. Um, and, uh, and then if we want to go further, um, we can discuss kind of those, those core beliefs, and, and if we disagree at that level, um, I can try to convince you. Otherwise, you can try to, try to convince me otherwise at the core belief level. Um, so the conclusion we're going to start with, um, John, I'll, I'll let you state because it was ultimately your conclusion, but I think the one I prompted was uh, that communism uh, and freedom can coexist in one society. So I, I guess just to start out with, you know, why, why do you believe that's the case? Well, you know, I, I think the uh, actually communism is freedom, as far as I, I'm concerned, and the reason for that is because under capitalist society, capitalist capitalism, um, you know, by its very nature, is an exploitative society, and uh, the for it to exist, the ruling class has to has to oppress uh, the working class. Um, and once uh, you have a, a, a classless society where you don't have classes, you don't have exploitation, uh, there's really nothing to hold back society, and there's nothing to hold back, uh, you know, uh, people from gaining their full democratic rights, uh, whether it be individual rights or collective rights, uh, to basic things that they, they need to exist. Uh, whether it be, uh, you know, a job, uh, housing, uh, education, clothing, uh, medical care, those kinds of things, um, society collectively provides. And so, in, uh, you know, people are able then to fully flower. Uh, they are uh, be able to develop all of their abilities to the full extent possible. And that's... Uh, uh, that, along with, you know, having a, go a society which is self-governing, uh, to me, is freedom. Okay, so that that brings up a few things. So the first, I guess, is I I'll need you to define freedom. And I think you, you did, for the most part, at the end there, but I guess I'll just ask you to restate that. And then also define uh, exploitation. Uh, and again, I think your explanation kind of covered that, but I just want to clarify so we have kind of concrete definitions for those. Um and then I guess my next question will be kind of the why to um, why is capitalism uh, inherently uh, exploitative, which I think is how you started. So uh, those three things, define freedom, define exploitation, and then why is capitalism exploited in and of itself? Uh, well, uh, you know, free, freedom to me uh, means a society which guarantees, uh, you know, a full range of rights um, uh, and guarantee, you know, guarantees uh, right, as I mentioned, to, um, you know, uh, political expression, to uh, religious expression, to, uh, you know, but also the, the right to a job, to uh, education, uh, health care, uh, affordable housing, uh, all the basic needs that people have. Um, if uh, people are free to express themselves politically and artistically, culturally, um, and uh, are fully equal uh, in society, uh, and, as long, and, and also are able to guarantee all the things that, that are necessary for them to live. Um, that's a free society. That's freedom. Um, and, you know, capitalism, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't allow that. Doesn't allow people to live a free, a free existence. There's all kinds of curbs on democracy and, um, you know, democratic rights. Uh, people have a hard time, uh, you know, just living. You know, uh, 
you know, young people going to school, you know, because it's unaffordable. Uh, there are so many people that are unemployed in our society. Um, many people are denied uh, the right to health care. Uh, and all those are at root, you know, they're all related to the exploitative society of capitalism, which is basically exploitation means that, um, well, the relationship between the capitalist uh, and work, a worker is one in which, um, you know, the worker is the one who provides their labor, labor power, on, and, and labor to produce a product. And the capitalist will uh, pay them a wage, but it's not a wage which is um, equal to the wealth that they produced. So it, that's, that's, in that way, the capitalist is exploiting the labor of, of a worker, and in so doing, is, is, is stealing part of the wealth that's been created by this worker. And that's how capitalists cre create their wealth. That's how they accumulate their wealth. So that's, that's the essence of, of exploitation. But it even goes further because even other parts of the ruling class, other parts of capitalist class w who are not directly related to the uh, production process will still exploit, you know, uh, workers uh, by uh, charging them uh, high rents or charging them, uh, you know, uh, high rates for loans, um, uh, you know, uh, and all kinds of things like that. So they have many ways that they, you know, kind of descend on the working class, so to speak, and, and take a further share of the social wealth that's been created. Okay. Um, that is clarifying. Um, there's one more definition I wanted to get, and I'm blanking on that, but I did come up with my next why question. Um, and well, Okay, so I guess the clarification I wanted to make. So I think I understand what you're saying about exploitation. I think what you're saying is that exploitation is essentially um, the surplus that's created in an economic exchange. Uh, so whatever the difference is between um, what the, in this case, the economic exchange is, is the labor, the, the person providing labor, uh, they're producing a certain amount, and then kind of the profit or whatever the surplus is that's created by that worker goes to the person who they're working for. And that's, I mean, that's the surplus. Um, but you're, you're basically equating that surplus with, with exploitation. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, and your reason for why, why capitalism is inherently exploitative is, is you see the, the owner or the, the person who is employing the labor as, as stealing that surplus. And so I guess my next why question is why is that, why is that stealing? Because generally, uh, you know, a working, uh, relationship is entered into, uh, with both parties in agreement. Uh, there's no coercion in general, uh, at least not in the literal sense. So I guess, why would you call that stealing? Well, it's the worker who's, who's the, the capitalist can't, uh, uh there, no wealth can be created without the, the worker doing the work. And um, it, it's the uh, capitalists who, uh, because they own and control the means of production, that is the factories and the, uh, you know, the uh, farms and, and so on, these big mega farms, because they, they control the, the, uh, this uh, productive system, uh, they're able to dictate things. They're, and so they're, they're able to, you know, uh, carry out their exploitation in that way. Um, but it's really the, you know, it's the working class that makes all that possible. It creates all this wealth. The capitalist doesn't create any wealth. In fact, most of these capitalists are not even part of, if you take the 1%, they, they don't do anything. They, you know, they uh, hand over their, um, the, the operation of their companies and whatnot to, uh, management and it's not they don't really do anything they're but they they are the ones that accumulate this unpaid wealth and that's how they amass their fortunes okay so the premise is that 
guess I still don't see the stealing aspect. Maybe we should define stealing. Um, but but because one party is is so I, I I suppose what you're saying is that because the capitalist uh, or, or the the uh, the one percent or our, we can just call them capitalists because the capitalists are taking um, are are getting something even without putting any effort in. Um, I'm not quite sure I agree with that premise that they're not doing any work because but even let's say I mean there could be cases where there are, where that is the case where someone has everything completely run by by management. So even in that case, we'll we'll take that. Um, extreme, if you will. Well, okay. well let, then let's, for the sake of, of, uh, of a little compromise in the argument sure. or the discussion, let's let's say that they that the capitalists can take a portion of that, um, but why do they have to have uh, so much? You know, that goes way beyond what um, uh, their role in the in the in the process. Even if they are the owners. Uh, they still don't do very much work. They might do, in some cases, there are owner managers and, and so on. But uh, for the most part, they do very little. So why don't they, why don't they just take a little sliver of, of it? The I whole mean, purpose of the capitalist system is to uh, create maximum profits. To sure. uh, you know, and it's a never-ending process. They're always trying to lower wages. Uh, you know, lower. Uh, and extract more, you know, wealth from uh, the productive process, and and really exploit, you know, workers even more than uh, what they are. So, so even your question, why do they take so much, or why can they take so much? I mean, the answer is because the workers let them. Because you know, when, when a worker uh, applies for a job, they accept a certain salary or a certain wage per hour, um, and and so they they let the capitalist um, take that amount of profit from them. Uh, and I would argue that they receive uh, a, a security um, in the form of, of a job, in the form of, of a, a set amount of money per inputs. And, and so in the end, I think that the, that the capitalist is, is getting that surplus um, from the, the risk that they're taking on. But that's kind of, we, we should get into that later. Uh, I think the, the question is, uh, I still want to come back to stealing because because it's a voluntary agreement between worker and, and capitalist, I don't understand why it's stealing. Um, and so even even the question, you know, why can they take so much? Well, it's because the worker agrees to let them take that much. Um, is that not true? Do you disagree with that statement? Well, I think the, the worker really has no choice um, in the matter because what the worker, the only thing that the worker has, and this is, gets into like Marx's theory, the only thing the worker has is their ability to work, their ability, their labor power. Um, but they don't—they don't have the means of production. They don't own the factories uh, under capitalism. Um, they only have their ability to, to labor, and if they don't labor, they starve. Um, and but it's the capitalist who has the the production uh, process. And by the way, uh, you know. Historically speaking, the capitalists have been able to, um, you know, gain that a, a lot of that through through thievery as well. Uh, if you look back historically, and by the way, you know, one of the big underpinnings of, of U.S. cap, actually global capitalism, was the system of slavery. Mm -hmm. and that was totally unpaid, uh, you know, uh, labor uh, for for hundreds of years, and uh, many of the great fortunes, you know. And wealth that was created came from uh, slave labor. Um, so it's that's so the so the worker has no choice. The worker either has to work or they starve. And it's only through the struggle, you know, once workers get organized and they start fighting back and they form unions and they may go on strike or whatever. Um, that's where they can get a little bit more of the. Uh, part of the social wealth that they create so uh, in the form of wages or health care or pensions or whatever you have so I, I i don't agree with the analogy of, of slavery to the working class i totally agree that slavery was stealing that was exploitation in its in its rawest form um because it wasn't voluntary there was there was no voluntary agreement between the slave and the the slave owner um but i i I don't see how that relates to um, 
the person, a, a modern worker. And, and you said they have no choice. And, and if that was the case, it, that would be like slavery. They would have no, no choice and it would be exploitation because uh, it would then, that would negate the voluntary aspect of it. Um, but I don't see that in, in, certainly not in American capitalism, um, where someone can go from one employer to another employer um, if they want to improve their job. Um, and if, if they are a capable worker, often another employer will have them. Um, they can uh, they, they can also go and start their own business, and many people have and been crazily suspe- successful. Um, and so I, I, I don't agree with the premise of, of workers having no choice. If I did, then I would totally agree that it's ex- exploitation. So I guess my next why question is, why, why would you say that, that the working class today has no choice? Well, I'm, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, they have no choice but to work. They have to work. They, that's, the, that's the only thing they have. They don't have control over the means of production. They don't have, they, they, they don't have uh, uh, they, like the capitalist does, they, they can't just draw on their investments and so on. They have to work. And if they don't work, then they starve or their families, you know, fall into destitution and, and so on. So that's the, that's the point I'm making. Um, and it's true they they get wage in return under you know a capitalist in the capitalist system, as opposed to slavery where you know slaves didn't get anything, um, but uh, they they do get you know they are a wage slave in in that sense because they have to work they're compelled to work. Okay, <clears throat> but what about what about Bill Gates? Bill Gates. Uh, he would have been in that same group. He dropped out of college. I don't know what his family was like, but as I, as far as I understand it, he started a company out of his garage, and uh, and, and rose up to be what someone that would now be considered a capitalist or, or, or an exploiter um, to use your system. But I don't see how how I mean he made that jump. Therefore, he, there is a choice, and maybe that's an extreme. But uh, I, I mean, you see that every day. People can go from. I mean, there is fluctuation in, in the classes today. People can go from having nothing to having something to having money work for them and, and through investments to go to be doing less and less uh, work, so to speak. Although I think we maybe should define work because, um, I mean, I think that, that it's very important that we include mental work in addition to, to manual labor because I think both add value. And as long as there's uh, you know, a value exchange, then, then money should be re- given in, or something should be given in return for that, uh, the value you generate with work. So I know I threw a few things at you, um, but I guess the main thing is just, again, a, a challenge on on the idea of there not being a choice, using the example of Bill Gates, uh, so you can respond to that, and then also, um, I guess, a, a, just a definition of work. I just want to make sure we're on the same page there. Well, there are, yeah, I mean, there are those uh, people, individuals who uh, do um, start out you know, uh, working class and then rise up uh, and are smart investors and or maybe make an invention. Um, and they um, rise up through work, though, right? They, they rise yeah. up through the process of work. Right. right. And so, I mean, uh, maybe if once we define work, we can get it, make it clear. But I mean, even if they start with work and then they eventually rise to a level where they're not working anymore, they still do that through work. And so I, I don't see how um, they, they, I, I still don't see how they have no choice. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. Well, yeah. I mean, Gates. I'm not sure that he's he he may be more uh, uh, of an example of you know having wealth that was passed on to him. I mean, like Trump. You know that whole study that they just did of of how Donald Trump became rich. I mean, his father. You know had a fort created a fortune through building homes and 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 whatnot um and there was a lot of exploitation there you know as he accumulated his wealth um but trump ended up you know uh, that that fortune ended up being passed along to trump and his brother and sister you know over a series of years and he ended up blowing a lot of it as well but uh that's for most rich families. That's how it happens. The families pass, you know, the wealth from one generation to the next. Um, but if you really look at a lot of those, like the, you know, uh, say the Rockefeller 
you know, Fortune, how that started with John D. Rockefeller. Um, you know, a lot of that was, yeah, smart businessman, but also he was ruthless, too. And he, he really uh, did it at the expense of other capitalists and also, obviously, you know, the workers. So um, there was a lot of shady stuff. And if you, if you look at the seamy side of most how most fortunes, including the Trumps, got, got accumulated, there's a lot of really nasty, seamy thing, sides to it, including illegal stuff that went on. So I, I don't want to defend bad capitalists. I don't want to defend, uh, and, I, and I, there's no need for me to. I, I don't, um, you know, I, I can't defend uh, shady business. Uh, and, and it definitely does take place because people are flawed. I mean, and, and people make mistakes. There are definitely shady things going on. Um, but I don't think that takes away from the premise of just capitalism in general, um, unless you think that capitalism leads to, to more shadiness. But even still, just coming back to this basic economic exchange that we're discussing, where we're talking about exploitation um, being inherently necessary in the economic exchange of a worker and, and the person who, the, the employer, um, you know, absent any of that shadiness, um, is that still exploitation? When you have a voluntary exchange of labor uh, for for a wage, and then the the, the employer takes that profit or that surplus uh, for his own profit, is that exploitation? Is that stealing? Well, I mean, we could we can agree to disagree on the use of the term, but uh, the point is that the capitalists will take you know take the surplus product you know and. Uh, they take as much as they feel they can get away with, and it's only through the struggle between the, you know, working class and the capitalists that, that, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's determined how much actually ends up in the hands of the, of the, uh, you know, the capitalist class. It's a little, you know, it's different than, you know, socialism, where, um, at least in, in theory, you know, socialism is a society where working people you know, also uh, labor, everybody labors, right? And the la labor is the essence of what we do, whether it be creative work or whatever. It's the essence of what we do to survive. It's our our ability to, uh, you know, interact with the, the, the world and to create the things that we need to survive and to thrive, you know, in, in society. But it's all through our labor power. It's our, you know, laboring... Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's our intervention, so, so to speak, with nature. Um, working, you know, through nature, uh, we create all the things that we need. But the the point of, of socialism is that, yeah, people still labor, um, and they still create wealth. Uh, but eventually, that that wealth goes not only to them directly, uh, so that they can live, um, but it the rest of the wealth goes to society as collectively, and then and then society collectively invests those things in things that people actually need, uh, whether it be you know healthcare or housing or mass transit or or uh, you know uh, preserving our our uh, green spaces, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, whereas the capitalists will take that, appropriate that uh, surplus privately for themselves and uh, they're never satisfied they're always trying to get more and more and more and that's that's the that's the essence of the problem that we have and that's why we have these crises that we're faced with today in society in particular I you know could make mention of the environmental crisis um, because you have a society in which the essence of capitalism is is it, it can't it, it has to it has to grow. It has to constantly grow, and uh, expanding markets and so on, and eventually, and it, it socializes the environmental damages, and so eventually it, it uh, creates such a crisis that it conflicts with possibility for human human survival. You just there's a limit to to the resources of of the world, and there's a limit to which. Uh, the world and nature can actually absorb all the, 
damage that the capitalist system is doing. So we're, we're kind of coming to that loggerheads now. Okay. So I, I do want to just review the process we've gone through and kind of figure out where what conclusion or what assumptions we can draw from this and kind of figure out where we disagree fundamentally. Um, because I think it does focus around that no choice. So kind of, I've just been writing down kind of the questions I've been asking. Um, so we started with the, the conclusion uh, that um, communism and freedom can coexist in society. Um, and uh, and you mentioned that, that capitalism is inherently exploitative. Um, and so we kind of took took that route. And so I asked why why is it exploitative? Uh, and uh, and you, you said because the economic exchange in its very nature is, um, or at least in, in the, the worker and employer relationship, um, is stealing uh, because the worker uh, has no choice. Uh, be, essentially can only, can only work. And I guess via society's conditioning, uh, basically has no, no choice but to work for the, for the employer. Um, I mean, that's where I would fundamentally disagree. I haven't really, I don't think that we've gotten any deeper than that. Um, I think that in a capitalist society, um, that, 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 that the employee, uh, has the ability to, to move around, um, from employer to employer and has the ability even to rise up in the ranks and, uh, and become the employer and, and, and change his, his class or his status, so to speak. Um, in a way that that gives him um, the choices that would negate the exploitation that you're describing. Um, so I guess that that's my position. And and so is this the point where we should just agree to disagree, or can we go any deeper? Is anything that I said? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you that um, some some workers uh, are able to, or whatever, through their their you know their work, their inventions, their um, you know the kinds of things that they do are able to uh you know rise up out of the out of the working class either become small business people or or even big capitalists uh that that does happen um but it's the exception not the rule and i think uh in fact i just saw some study not too long ago that um you know u.s society in particular it's really difficult for people to escape the working class. They're kind of locked into their economic status, so to speak. Um, and it gets even harder because uh, as capitalism has been developing, and it's, it's, a, it's a society that's been evolving over time, you know, it's become more and more, con wealth has become more and more concentrated in a few hands. So you have these, these uh, you know, Oxfam and other uh, you know, uh, studies that have been put out recently. I, I I can't keep up with them, but, you know, just a few capitalists control, you know, like half the wealth of the United States and similar thing globally. Um, but that's been, and then you have within e each industry, you know, have, you have high concentration, monopolization of, of each industry. So uh, this is a, this is a historic process. This is what happens with capitalism. And this is part of this, uh, you know, accumulation of wealth, and uh, it's something which Marx, and I'm sure you read it when you read the Communist Manifesto. He he foresaw this a long time ago that capitalism, you know, it's just its natural tendency is to is to form monopolies and to lead to concentration of wealth in a very few hands. So it so it, that that in and itself makes it very difficult for uh, working people to ever rise above that. In fact, most people who uh, you know, there's probably more capitalists who end up being uh, stripped of their of their fortunes, you know, and end up in poverty and so on than uh, working people who end up becoming rich. Okay, um, and maybe maybe that's where we should just agree to disagree. Um, I don't think I agree with the premise. I'd be interested to see some of the studies that you're describing. Um, but I, I couldn't quote you any numbers right now about how hard it is or whatnot. Um, so I, I, I suppose that, that is kind of where we would have to agree to disagree. You're saying that it's the exception, not the rule. Um, 
but I mean, I would I would just say that because of the volunteer exchange, there's just no. Well, there is choice. There's no. Therefore, there's no ceiling. Therefore, there's no exploitation. Therefore, capitalism is um, not inherently exploitative. Um, uh, okay. I, I mean, I, I think we've basically staked out those positions. So I think you're. I, um, I think your clarification that it's the exception, not the rule, is uh, is basically where we disagree. Um, so we kind of went a little bit away from, I guess, the, the initial conclusion. That's okay, because a lot of times these things can kind of take you down in a different path. Um, so is there another branch we can take from the initial conclusion of uh, capitalism, or I'm sorry, communism and, and, and freedom coexisting? Um, so I guess I'll... I'll maybe start with kind of one of my conclusions and we can kind of do this in reverse. So I think that uh, reading Marx and then just based on, on communist uh, discussions as far as I, I, any solutions that communists, that communists or um, kind of communism as a doctrine presents are always uh, focused on um, a central government directing things. Um, and so I think that centralization of power leads to, to serfdom, as, as Hayek uh, re points out in, in The Road to Serfdom. Um, so that idea of, of just centralizing power will inevitably um, lead to, to results that are totally uh, in... in um, uh, they, they don't go at all with uh, freedom and will actually lead to uh, totalitarianism. Um, so I guess we can do this in reverse. Um, I, well, let's stick with me asking the why questions. But do you disagree with that, and then and why? Uh, well, yeah, I do disagree with it. But there, there is. Let, let me let me try to answer it from this angle. Sure. Um, you know, most people I think kind of equate uh, communism with totalitarianism, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, you know that's. Uh, uh, I think they they. Uh, you know, they, they, they see that because, or they say that because of uh, the um, different experiences that we've had with, that, that the world has seen, you know, with uh, building socialism uh, since, really since the Russian Revolution, you know. Um, and, but the, the problem there is that, and, and by the way, I, I don't, I'm not going to even, uh, dispute, you know, uh, the fact that there were real problems, you know, with uh, socialism as it existed in, in the Soviet Union, despite tremendous achievements <clears throat> on a whole number of fronts, both economically and politically, and also its role in the world <clears throat> in terms of uh, fighting fascism and helping national liberation movements and other, and, and so on. But there were real problems with um, you know, the uh, political democracy. There's no doubt about it. I, and the reason that I think this is the case is because <clears throat> socialism arose first in extremely backward conditions. In, in Russia at the time, it was, you know, 90% agrarian society, a very little working class, uh, massive poverty. Uh, but you also had... Uh, this revolution taking place in the global context of world war and also the encirclement by capitalist powers and you had a civil war that followed um and then uh, not too long after that you know the rise of fascism and uh you know the soviet union was forced to uh, militarize and to defend itself and then you had the cold war so it's almost its entire existence uh, was under these stresses, whether it be under development or militarization or war. And uh, they, they were never, you can't, create, you can't create a democratic society in those kinds of conditions. I'm, I'm convinced of it. Um, and, uh, and then you, you have to add in there, you know, you had a, a legacy of, of uh, you know, the czarism and 
feudalism that carried over, there were no mass democratic uh, institutions uh, that were had deep roots, you know, in uh, Russian society. Um, and so you had the also had the emergence at that time, also kind of with the development of of socialism, of certain amount of authoritarianism. Um, and I think you you also saw saw that to a similar degree in China as well. Um, and because China was and also uh, Vietnam and Cuba were all very underdeveloped societies, very small working class underdeveloped societies. And in all of them, um, you know, they they were they developed in the course of uh, you know war and you know poverty and and so on. It's really hard. It seems possible, as far as I'm concerned, to develop. Well, I shouldn't say impossible, but it's extremely difficult to develop democratic institutions under those kinds of of circumstances. Um, that's why Marx foresaw that socialism would come first in the more advanced industrial societies, the ones, including the ones that had a democratic, bourgeois democratic traditions, um, and that, uh, you know, the working class could um, build, you know, socialism much more easy, much easier, you know, in those kinds of circumstances. But that's not how, how it happened. So naturally, people see, see that and they equate, you know, socialism or communism with uh, all these you know, horrible things that happened uh, during that era. But I don't think it has to be that way. And I I think, for example, uh, with uh, our society, the United States, we, we start from very different kinds of circumstances. We have a very high level of material standard of living. We have a very big working class. It's highly educated. We have a long history and struggle for democracy, which the working class and and people have led all these years. Um, and so that will be the basis upon which we have socialism in the United States. And eventually it will develop into a communist society. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying, and I understand that uh, I'm not going to make you defend bad communists in the same way that I can't defend bad capitalists. Um, I still want to focus on the consolidation of power because i think any communist solution um tends to require a lot of government intervention at least at first um in, in a very centralized manner that it's generally hard to manage via democracy uh, if anything you'd have to via democracy elect um a person or, or, or a few people with with a lot of power in order to carry out a lot of these things um, what I was just flipping to the page in the Communist Manifesto where he talks about you know the 10 uh, things that would first need to happen um, and maybe this is dated but just things like um, abolition of all right of inheritance um, well if there's no right of inheritance then where does the in inheritance go I, I suppose it would have to be distributed by the by the government so it would be a, a government solution uh, confiscation of all property um, of all immigrants and uh, and rebels uh, centralization of credit in the hands of the state uh, extension of factories and, and instruments of production owned by the state so I guess the point I'm trying to make is um, the solutions are all focused around a very strong central government um, and I guess I, I hold to the the old dictum that um, you know power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and so I, I don't see how you could accomplish those things without consolidating power to an, to an extent that would be, um, at, at the very least, very, very dangerous and precarious. What do you think about that? <clears throat> well, you know, society needs government. You have to have government in order to organize things collectively. Uh, it's, a, it's the collective expression of, of how society organizes itself. Um, the problem that you have, for example, in the United States is that the <clears throat> government is more or less uh, dominated by the interests of the one percent, um, and of course, in you know fractions of it, you know the extreme right fraction is the you know dominating our our government today, which has got its own set of problems, you know. Um, 
But what if you had a government where the um, president and and the Senate and Congress were were made up of working people, you know, like you and I, I mean, who were elected from the grassroots, uh, where you took the money out of politics, um, and people were, were elected on their leadership abilities and, and on their merits. Um, and the sole purpose of government was to try to make life better for people. Um, and, and also, I think that, um, you know, you have to you really have to create a, a, a way to democratically manage, um, you know, the different aspects of society. So, for example, um, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, the, the, the utilities, you know, the um, uh, cell phone, you know, the communications apparatus and so on, if that's publicly owned, um, then it should be also publicly managed. So you have to create the organs for that to happen. Um, and including, you have to, we have to figure out how to, um, you know, uh, manage things in a decentralized way. That's one of the things that the Cubans are, are beginning to do. They're beginning to decentralize a lot of the management of industry and uh, various sectors and, and so on. So Still within the government though? Well, I mean, yeah, they're creating cooperatives. They have a whole cooperative sector, you know, where the workers actually run, you know. And I, I was at a restaurant there when I was there a couple of years ago that was completely managed by the, the workers, and they're trying to expand that whole sector so that uh, that becomes a much bigger part of it. But nevertheless, the idea is you got to have, you got to figure out how to manage things. So I take, for example, the, the, the way when the TVA was set up, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that, that was a huge publicly owned uh, electrification of the south, you know, the Appalachian region and, and the south. Uh, but it was publicly owned and it was managed, of course, by the government. But, um, you know, it, it, we have to figure out how to, and sometimes it doesn't, it, it doesn't work. The corporations, uh, you know, will... Um, will hone in on things. So you, you do have to have for certain, you have to figure out how to have certain checks and balances to make sure that, that, uh, you know, it becomes democratic and, and the control and management of things is, is democratic and it's decentralized. Okay. So, so I suppose you're, you're describing some other mechanisms that, still maintain government control but also decentralization because decentralization usually kind of goes with privatization but you're, that's not what you're describing no okay not at all. interesting so maybe some other mechanisms that i'm not as familiar with uh, for decentralizing power but you at least agree that that decentralizing power is important in a communist society um otherwise even in even in america i think that you could end up producing some similar results to what you saw in, in um, you know, post-World War II Russia. And, and I think that yeah. it's that power that really does um, become dangerous. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in a capitalist society, the, the, the government really is, in a lot of ways, it's, it's because it's dominated by the 1% or the capitalist class, it actually facilitates the accumulation of wealth. Uh, you know, in a million ways, whether, you know, through regulations or through contracts or, you know, by laws, you know, and, and so on. Um, and so it has, it has a very dominant kind of role. Um, once the, you know, through the course of change and once the working class and its allies assume political power, um, they can begin to change that. They can begin to change how government operates, you know, and, and uh, uh, so that it doesn't operate for the benefit of the corporations, but it operates for the benefit of people. It's a different kind of state in that sense. And, um, but as Marx pointed out, eventually the state, as society develops, the state will wither away. Um, first, the, the oppressive, you know, parts of it, and, you know, the... Uh, that's a big part of the capitalist state is the oppressive apparatus, the police forces, the military, and 
and so on. Um, but once you, you have a receding of the class conflict, you don't really need that anymore, you know. Uh, and so, you know, almost immediately you can begin to disband, uh, you know, the repressive apparatus of the state. And, it, and the core functions really are, you know, governing to make life better for people. All right. Well, John, I, uh, I, I think this has been a, a fruitful discussion. Um, do you have any, any other closing areas you want to discuss or anything that you want to, you want to pitch? Um, I think for the purposes of kind of the postulate challenge, we've, we've done that. And, and uh, I want to make this a good, another example of um, that form of discussion. Uh, I think I've learned a little bit more about your position. Um, and, uh, and, and if we were going to, to have more of a debate, then we could start, we could kind of do that postulate challenge a few more times with several different branches, uh, and then we could challenge each other's uh, core beliefs. Um, but I, I think for the purposes, for the sake of, of example anyway, an illustration, um, we've done that pretty well. Uh, any, any closing remarks on your side? Uh, well, I mean, I, maybe you, this would be something you wouldn't agree with, but I, I think that um, it's actually going to be necessary to, for human survival to replace capitalism. I think uh, capitalism has created some, some huge problems that it can't, it's incapable of solving. Um, and in fact, one of the problems is the erosion of de democracy and democratic rights. Another might be the, uh, you know, around the uh, existential threat uh, posed by the climate crisis and so on. So I don't, I don't know, do you, how do you feel about that? Oh, well, okay. I mean, I guess I would just, I would start by saying why, why, why do you think that capitalism is, is needs to be dismantled? Well, as I said, I think there, there are some uh, existential crises that are occurring and at root, I think is the capitalist drive for profit. Uh, the, the, ma the main one being the climate crisis. I think that, that, uh, capitalism as a system is inherently hostile to nature uh, because its whole, uh, you know, uh, the essence of it is is constant expansion, expansion of markets, uh, you know, um, and it can't it can't coexist with nature for very long. I mean, it's it's been a very destructive force uh, since its inception, but now it's gotten to the point because it's because of it of its expansion and its mere size uh, that it's actually now become an existential threat to, uh, to, you know, world. And, uh, you know, because, you know, the, the drive for profits means that it, uh, it, it can't, um, or it, it, yeah, it can't, it won't, um, for example, spend uh, part of the profits on, uh, you know, cleaning, uh, pollution, you know, that, that is emitted from, uh, from it, the production process. Um, so, you know, like a lot of these coal, uh, fired power plants and so on, they won't put scrubbers on and, uh, and, you know, or the auto industry won't build, uh, you know, cars that, uh, you know, they get, you know, huge uh, mileage and so on. So it's, it's a very destructive, system that uh, is coming more and more in conflict with nature and we're going to have to eventually, in my opinion, I don't know what you think about it, but in my opinion, I think we're going to have to eventually go on an alternative path and develop. That's kind of how I see sure. socialism in the United States. Well, since you're asking me, I'll, I'll step out of the whys and just, I guess, state kind of my thoughts on that. Um, I, I think that... Um, my stance on, especially when it comes to the environment, is uh, I think any of the issues that we're facing with the environment are more as a result of um, the technological advances we've made and, and the, 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 the ways in which we are producing things. But I don't think that those would change regardless of, of who's producing. You might be able to, to limit them or to uh, constrain them more with a centralized power. Um, but as, as long as we're still consuming things, I think that a lot of the um, 
environmental impacts that we're having on the earth um, would would still happen. So I guess I don't see why capitalism is is pushing that along. And, and in fact, I think that long run capitalism now cap, there, there is a a short term desire for profits. But like you said, the goal of capitalism is to maximize profits. And so it really is in the capitalist interest to preserve resources to um, to, actually, to to uh, to make sure that there are resources going forward um, in order to maximize profits long term. Um, and so I think just balancing, uh, I, I mean, I guess in terms of solutions, I, I don't see a solution coming from um, big government unless it is just uh, constraining and confining which I think then you lose a lot of the benefits that we get from modern technology. Um, and, and if, so I guess if you accept the premise that that's what needs to happen, then perhaps the only way to do that would be through, um, through, through a centralized power. But I actually don't think that either, because I think that um, true capitalists should be looking at the long-term maximization of profits, which requires uh, that, uh, preserving of, of resources and of, I mean, the earth and, and our ability to live here. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the advantages of a, of a socialist orientation would be then that, that a, a government that was committed to, um, you know, addressing cl the climate crisis, for example, or even the plastic, you know, plastics crisis, um, could offer both incentives, you know, for, you know, to, for, to, to speed up the transition to renewables, um, or could, could, uh, invest, you know, the social wealth into, um, creating new technologies, um, or could invest the social wealth into environmental cleanup. Um, and that's, of course, that's something we're having a hard time because those are public goods, they would require government uh, intervention. So I, I think that the premise that I probably disagree with most is um, the crisis aspect of it. Um, I'm not convinced that we're at a crisis point. Um, I'm not entirely convinced about the the, the man-made uh, effects on on climate. But even if you take that, I I don't see that we're at a crisis point yet. Um, and then I guess to take a step further, I just don't see how the the government ultimately is going to solve it just based on the legislation that's that's been out there like even the, the Paris Accord as I understand it wouldn't have a, a huge impact on um, ultimately what's going on you know in in, in the the climate uh, maybe it's just unsuccessful piece of legislation there could be better but it, so I guess I still don't see government as being the ultimate way to go I still think that you could do uh, a better job even if we were at that crisis point through capitalistic mechanisms. Um. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's true that I think uh, ultimately the market forces will probably uh, move us in the direction of uh, renewables, you know, because it's cheaper to produce uh, solar and wind power generated electricity than it is coal. You know, it's, they're competitive, and then eventually it'll be cheaper to do that through. Uh, um, but you still have, you know, a lot of resistance by, you know, the coal industry to giving that up. And um, we, uh, and also, you know, you have a, of course, you have the auto industry, which uh, they consume, you know, through the production of these automobiles. They produce, you know, tens of millions of automobiles, which are consuming tremendous amounts of oil um, and one of the things that I thought the Obama administration did that was very good was during the you know when they saved the auto industry one of the things they mandated was and this was through the legislation was that they had to the auto industry in order to get the loans you know to to save them they had to agree to you know increase the mileage on their vehicles and that in itself saved you know, billions of tons of carbon from being, you know, sent up into the atmosphere. So that's a that's a pos that's an example of a positive step that government can take in, under these kinds of circumstances. 
But you know, you have even on local local uh, governments, or maybe there's even a national program. I don't know. But I've I've been in communities that give incentives, you know, for homeowners, for example, to put solar panels on their uh, roofs. You know, so you can do all those kinds of things to really speed up, you know, the process of addressing these issues. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any more thoughts on, on that particular issue. So, all right. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on. I think this has been a good discussion. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think there's just some disagreement about some basic, I guess, aspects of, um, well, I, I think that in the end, a lot of it comes down to kind of your view of, of, of man. And uh, because I, I tend to see man as, as inherently self-interested, uh, I think that capitalism is the only system that takes that and works it in a, in a positive, puts a positive spin on it and basically makes it so that that self-interest actually ends up benefiting other people through the creation of, of inventions or, or whatever, through creation of value, through economic exchange. Um and I don't see any other system that would work because I see man as being inherently um, self-interested. So I don't see how you could even create the the unity that would be required in communism. Um, so I think that's kind of the fundamental difference that I, I would have. Um, do you agree with that view of man or do you have a more positive view of man? Yeah, I, ha I do. I think, well, I, th I think uh, human beings change, you know, un under circumstances and, so, you know, we, we know that society has, has gone through different uh, stages of development, you know, from uh, primitive communal living uh, through slave societies and feudal societies, and now, you know, capitalist society. And in the primitive communal society, I mean, everybody worked together for the common benefit, you know, and... So what was it that changed? You know, obviously it was, well, I mean, Marxists will tell you, you know, it was the, uh, you know, the, the societies ended up producing more wealth than they could uh, manage. And so, uh, you know, there was a struggle over the division of it eventually. And, and that's when you began to have classes. But, but nevertheless, people, for ages, people existed you know, and work together for the common good, you know, uh, to survive. And I, I, to me, that can be a, you know, that can be the central core of our values going forward, or, or it can be a, you know, social society. And people change under circumstances. I mean, when you, uh, you know, we talk about people uh, learning, uh, you know, not being born haters or racists or, sexist at birth but they learn it well people learn to be selfish too and um, they can unlearn it as well and just like people can unlearn being racist and uh, so I, I have a I guess I have a very optimistic uh, view of humankind and, and what we're going to be able to accomplish it's obvious that you know as, as you go along not everybody's like that but, you know, society eventually is able to organize itself so that that becomes the overriding values, set of values by which people live by. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Uh, John, is there any place where people can find you? you have a Twitter or anything you'd like to plug? I do have a Twitter, John Bachtel, J-O-H-N-B-A-C-H-T-E-L-L. -L. Uh, you can also check out our website, the Communist Party website at cpusa.org, and we have a lot of stuff there, fresh content practically every day. And we also um, uh, have a, well, there's a, a newspaper which reflects our point of view oftentimes uh, called People's World. Uh, it's also a voice of labor and people's movements. That's peoplesworld.org. And a lot of great articles on both those websites, so I uh, urge you to take advantage of them. And also we have uh, regular webinars and 
uh, those kinds of things. So if you want to sign up, you'll get notices about all that stuff. All right. Thanks again, John, for coming on. I really appreciate it. We'll stay in touch. It's been a great conversation. Thanks a lot.